Good evening. It is truly a joy to be here. I've looked forward to being a part of this lectureship ever since I first was invited. Uh, I say ever since, uh, when I received notice of uh, three manuscripts that were to be as long as they were for a short time, I didn't look forward to it. <clears throat> uh, but I really have looked forward to being here. I appreciate the elders and the uh, faculty at the School of Preaching uh, for the opportunity to come and be here. I count it a high honor to be invited anywhere to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is nothing that should be more Im important in our minds and certainly nothing that is more important in the hearts and souls of those who want to go and spend an eternity and truly live on and on. I wonder how many preachers have used 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 to talk about the dangers of associating with bad people, immoral people, people living bad lives. Now, I will grant you that I think that principle is within the passage. But the reality is that that particular verse is in a context that would suggest that the problem that arose in the city of Corinth over a loss of the belief in the resurrection from the dead arose because of association with false teachers. Be not deceived, evil companionships corrupt good morals. And that is precisely what had happened in the city of Corinth. The Apostle Paul opens this powerful chapter by reminding them that he had preached this very gospel to them when he came their way. How that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He then proceeded to demonstrate beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus was raised from the dead. Bringing forth over 500 witnesses to that resurrection. If I ever am charged with a crime, I would love to have 500 people that would say, he could not have done it, he was with us. That would be marvelous. And that is precisely the argument that the Apostle Paul is making. We have 500 plus witnesses. Jesus was raised from the dead. He then immediately went into the fact that that is the very crux of our faith that without the belief in the resurrection of the dead, our faith is really worthless and it makes our lives empty. And having said that, he then goes back to the fact that he has established that Jesus Christ is in reality raised, and then he comes to this powerful thought that we will discuss tonight in verses 20 through 28, the resurrection and the end time. The first thing that he observes is Christ is the first fruits. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, the Apostle Paul says, Now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. What does he mean, first fruits? This student of Gamaliel, this Hebrew of Hebrews, this one born of the tribe of Benjamin, who was, as touching the law, a Pharisee. This one surely would have known precisely what he was talking about when he talked about the first fruits. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, and beginning at verse 9, the writer Moses tells us about that sacrifice. And he says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land which I give to you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. It is imperative for us to realize that the Apostle Paul was making a dual reference here to this prophecy. The idea that we most often capture, and certainly is a prominent one, is that Jesus Christ is the first fruits from the grave. And there can be no denying that. 
They offer the first fruits of the barley harvest on the Sunday after the Passover. And they offered this as the first cutting of the harvest in thankful celebration of the great harvest that was to come. In point of fact, the barley harvest still stood in the fields, all except for this sacrifice that they would make on that day. And by making that sacrifice, they were clearly saying, thank God for the harvest to come. I believe when the Apostle Paul refers to that in this particular passage, by inspiration, that he is setting before us this idea. Thank God for the harvest that is to come. We believe and know that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And if Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, then so will we all be raised. But do not miss the second part. And that is that this offering of the first fruits, this wave offering of thanksgiving to the Lord, was always offered on the first day of the week following Passover. Now, I would ask all of us to remind ourselves of one simple thought When was Jesus raised from the dead? The Lord's Day after the Passover. And Paul declares he is the first fruits. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. It's a euphemism. You know, we usually use that word. We're talking about some sort of a word that folks use to soften a curse word. That's usually the way we use it. But the reality is that a euphemism is something that is used to soften anything that might be a little bit harsh to talk about. I don't know what you've observed, but in my experience with folks in general, and even myself, I've discovered that for the most part, we will not say, this particular person has died. Or this particular person is dead. Instead, we tend to say, They've fallen asleep. They've passed. Or some such as that. Well, that is precisely the idea that the Apostle Paul is setting forth here. That there are those in the grave about whom we are all concerned and for whom we all have an interest. And so he informs us or reminds us that Jesus was the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, thereby indicating that they, he will not be the last, but instead there is a great harvest to come. In the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning at verse 13, the Apostle Paul writes to a church that is struggling with a similar problem. It appears that though they believed in the resurrection of Christ, that they had come to think that if a Christian died before the Lord came back, then they would be in the grave forevermore. They would never see the resurrection of Christ. And so the Apostle Paul comes back with this powerful thought. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Christ is the first fruits, but the very fact that he is the first fruits indicates that others will follow. All Christians who may have died before the coming of the Lord can be assured that if they died in the Lord, that God has the power to raise them from the dead, the very power that he demonstrated in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ, the first fruits. But then second. Paul wants us to know all will be made alive in Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 21 and 22, the apostle continues writing about these matters, and here's what he says. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Now, all of us are familiar with the 
the writings of Moses, particularly the book of Genesis, is popular with many of us. You may remember that after God made man of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul, that God gave him but one law, a law that is stated clearly in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you will surely die. We know that in the very next chapter, Moses revealed through the inspiration of God that Adam and his wife Eve ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because of that, they were separated from the tree of life. But now I want you to think about that. If man is separated from the tree of life, if a guard is stationed outside of the Garden of Eden so that no one will ever again be able to get to that tree, then guess what that means for me? Guess what that means for you? In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 the writer of Hebrews states what to us may now be obvious. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. All of us, as a consequence of the sin of Adam, face an appointment with death. We unconditionally, in Adam, lost our lives. Now listen to that. Unconditionally. That is, I didn't do anything to bring about the sure fact that I will physically die. That's a reality for all men. That there is not a single man who lives on the earth who has done anything that guarantees that he'll die. Now, some do violate the law and thereby face a, a punishment with death, but they would have died anyway. Had they have lived without violating the law, they would die. We all will. That's a guarantee. That's an unconditional result of the sin of Adam. But we need to realize something else, and it's what Paul is pointing out here. And that is that Jesus is, after all, the resurrection and the life. Go back to John chapter 11. In John chapter 11, you may remember that Jesus has left the area of Judea. He's gone away from there because his life has been threatened, and it's not quite time for him to die. Now a report has come from Mary and Martha that says that Lazarus, their brother, is sick and bidding the Lord to come. I think that the clear implication of their request is that they think if the Lord comes that Lazarus will get over his illness, that the Lord will cause him to recover. I do not think that they anticipated what was about to take place. Jesus informed the disciples that Lazarus is asleep. Notice that even he uses the euphemism there. And it's so strong and so ready are they to accept the idea that they say, well, that's good. If he's sleeping, he's going to get better. And then he plainly says, Lazarus is dead. And then he says, I'm glad for your sakes. Something great is going to take place then when Jesus gets to the city of Bethany. He arrives and he begins a discussion with Martha, one of the sisters of Lazarus. He tells her that her brother will be raised from the dead. And she, with great confidence, says, I know that he will be raised in the resurrection of the last day. That's a powerful statement because the whole group of the Sadducees didn't know that. But Martha did. She was well acquainted with it. She understood it because she had been in close contact with the Lord. But then in verse 25, Jesus responds to her and says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Now, that has a specific meaning for Lazarus. He's going to live very soon. The Lord in his power as God come down to earth is going to raise him from the dead. And that's what he's telling Martha. But she doesn't know it. But I'll go a step beyond that. That same power that he demonstrated in the resurrection of Lazarus is still well within his grasp. 
And we, brethren, can count on the fact that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. We'll go on down in the chapter. You'll recall the passage that all the children like to recite if they have to do a memory verse. Jesus wept. Very important passage, by the way. One that I like to see children talk about. All right, good. He wept. Now explain to me why that's significant. Well, it's very significant. Uh, it leads to uh, some thoughts. Uh, first of all, he already knew he was going to raise him from the dead. He told Martha that. He'd also told the apostles that something great was coming. And so he already knew he wasn't going to stay in the grave. He's not weeping then for his own loss, is he? He may be weeping because of the sorrow that he sees in the lives of Mary and Martha. That's a possibility. It's the one that I'll have to tell you, most frankly, I have leaned toward for a long time, but there is another possibility. And that is he is crying because he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus is in a better place. And he's going to bring him back to this place for a time. And it may be he's crying for that. Or you could go a step further because our Lord certainly has the capacity to understand all things. It's possible that he's weeping for both those things. He's weeping for the loss of Mary and Martha and, in a certain sense, the loss of Lazarus, who will come back for a time and walk on the earth. But whatever the case may be, Jesus wept, demonstrating his compassion, not only for them, but for all of us. Now, watch verse 39 as we go on, where Jesus says, take away the stone. You remember Martha's response to that, Lord, (laughs) He's been in the grave for four days. By now, he stinks. Now, that's a significant thought. You see, the Jews of the first century believed that corruption began to take place on the fourth day. I want you to briefly go to Pentecost and think about what the Apostle Peter said. He quoted from the Old Testament, from the Psalms, And noted that David said, Thou wilt not suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. What's he telling us? He's telling us by inspiration that Jesus will not stay in the grave more than three days. And in reality, since the Lord himself gave the sign of Jonah in Matthew chapter 12, we can be assured of the fact that he will only be in the grave three days. Nonetheless, by this time, Lazarus stinks. By this time, the body has begun to decay. It has begun to rot. And yet, Jesus insists that the stone be rolled away. And in verse 43, at the end, we hear him say, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. What a marvelous thought is present in that place. We can be assured that all the righteous dead will be raised to live again because Jesus was raised to live again. But we need to go a step further. The resurrection The gaining back of everything we lost unconditionally in Adam will extend even to the wicked dead. That is, what they lost unconditionally in Adam, they will gain back unconditionally in Christ. In John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, Jesus says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of condemnation. I'm starting to realize that I'm getting older. This illustration will mean nothing to some people, but I lived through an era when there was a rock band called Blood, Sweat, and Tears. And they sang a song in which they said, I know there ain't no heaven. And I pray there ain't no hell. We in this generation have millions of people 
who are praying that all they do is die and go to the tomb eternally. Who hope that they're just going to be obliterated and that's going to be the end of it. And some of our brethren are writing books and preaching lessons designed to encourage that thought. Brethren, that thought is false. There is demonstrable proof in the New Testament that both the wicked and the righteous will be raised from the dead. That everything, that every man lost unconditionally in Adam, you will get back unconditionally in Christ. In other words, there is no question tonight that you will live eternally or that I will live eternally. The question is, where will we live eternally? So Christ is the first fruits. All will be made alive in Christ. But then third, the Apostle Paul looks at the order of the resurrection. Look, if you would, to chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians again. This time we want to look at verse 23. Where the Apostle Paul makes a short, powerful statement. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Each in his own order. The word in the original language is tagma, and it means each in his own sequence. And it literally carries the idea, oftentimes, of rank. In other words, have you ever heard in the military of the chain of command? I know enough about the military to know this. If you're in the service, you have to know the chain of command. If you're a private, you have to know who your sergeant is. You have to know who your lieutenant is. You have to know who your captain is. You have to know who the commander of the unit is, the base, if it happens to be a base. You have to know who the uh, secretary of the whatever branch you're in is. And you have to know who the commander in chief is. All the way up the line, you have to know them all. From bottom to top, you have to know them. That is the word that's used here. Now remember, he's already told us who the number one in rank is. Christ, the first fruits. The Son of God was the first to be raised from the dead to die no more, but be assured that the rest of us are going to be raised as well in our order. In 1 Thessalonians again, chapter 4, and beginning at verse 15, the Apostle Paul says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. It's interesting. But the Thessalonian brethren who seemingly struggled with this concept of resurrection for the dead saints now had a second struggle. The second struggle after they received this book was, well, if everybody's going to come out of the grave, then that means those people that have been tormenting us, those people who have been persecuting us, are going to be raised as well. And that's of concern to us. And so Paul almost immediately seems to have dashed off a second letter. The second letter to the Thessalonian brethren. And as he writes to them in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning at verse 5. Let's back up to verse 4. He says, So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God, for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Now, the word he used there for tribulations in the original language is thlipsis. And the idea is pressing or a pressure. You're undergoing intense stress, we would say. And he says, I'm thankful for the fact that you are enduring it. Then he goes on. Which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer, since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation 
those who trouble you. It's interesting. He now is changing uh, the word. He comes back with flipsis again, but he next comes to the word trouble, and that's the word flibo. And flibo describes the squeezing of a grape until all the juice comes out. Now you imagine the intense pressure that the church is undergoing, even to the point of some of them dying, and it is a lot like squeezing the juice out of a grape. He says, they trouble you, and now to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Several significant things within that particular passage. The Lord is going to be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. That sounds familiar. That sounds like what he said in the first book, in chapter 4. Yes, it is a fact that the Lord is going to be revealed and he's going to reclaim his own. He's going to reclaim first those that are dead in Christ and then those who are alive in Christ. But now he tells us that the order of, of resurrection goes beyond that. And those who have troubled the saints, those wicked ones who have persecuted and tormented and tortured God's people will also be raised. And they will be raised to punishment. Two classes are described by the Lord. Those who know not God. And someone says, yes, I figured that. The atheists are going to be punished. Well, that's a part of the group, but it's not the whole group. Because the idea behind the words, know not God, are very simple. It means they've never come into an intimate relationship with God. There is a demonstration of that somewhat in the Old Testament. In the book of Genesis, chapter 4, verse 1, when it says, And Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived, and bare a son. Now, I'm not going to get into a biology lesson here, but I think everybody here knows that that means more than Adam met Eve. They came into an intimate relationship. Here, the Apostle Paul says, everybody that never came into an intimate relationship with God through being added to the body of his son, Jesus Christ, will be punished. But who else will be punished? Those that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It appears he's saying the same thing in different words. That would be a Hebrew parallelism. It's not unknown, even in the New Testament, but that's not the point here. Because if you study these words in the original language, what he literally is saying, those who do not keep on obeying the gospel. Now think about this. Matthew chapter 25, and what may be one of the most popular parables, best known among all people. You have the case of the ten virgins. I want us to observe the opening statements of the Lord as he begins that parable. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be like. We'd say it a different way. Then shall the church be like. And it's like ten virgins. Five wise, five foolish. What do you know about the foolish virgins? They are shut out of the feast. Even though at one time they knew God. Even though at one time they were in a, an intimate relationship with him, the day is coming when they are not prepared for the Lord to come back, and because of that, they will be shut out. That's what Paul's talking about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. But then he says they'll be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. We, we would add one word to understand it best in English. Away from. They're going to be punished away from the Lord. They're not going to be able to be with the Lord in eternity. But in contrast to that, the saints will be glorified. They will be robes of glory for the Lord.
That's the image that he puts in that 10th verse when he comes to be glorified in his saints. So now we've seen that Christ is the first fruits, that all will be raised because of Christ. We have seen the order of the resurrection, and now Paul says all enemies will be brought into subjection. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this time beginning at verse 25, the apostle goes on to say, For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. First thought, Christ is now reigning. That's what he said. He is seated and everything is put under him, but not yet everything. All things, but not all things. You see, the last great enemy that will be defeated is the enemy called death. And while Jesus himself has overcome the grave, his body, the church, has not overcome the grave. And so not everything is yet entirely under his feet. Paul talks about it again first, uh, in the first chapter of Ephesians, beginning at verse 19. Where he says, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion. And every name that is named. Not only in this age but also in that which is to come. And he has put all things under his feet. And it's given him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Jesus is now in authority. Jesus is now reigning. That is the evident argument of Paul, both in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and also in Ephesians chapter 1. But it also is the argument of the Apostle Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22, Peter says, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. But how do you know? How do we know that, they, that he is in heaven and that he is at the right hand of God? In John chapters 14, 15, and 16, Jesus repeatedly says, God is going to send another comforter. The word's paraclete. It means to call to one side, to encourage. That's the idea that is contained within that word. Another paraclete, that indicates that Jesus himself was a comforter, and he was. One who called them to his side and encouraged them. No doubt about that. But he says there's another one coming. And then in chapter 16 in particular of John, he indicates, I must go back to the Father so that the other comforter can come. When I went to Freed Hardman College, it was a college back in those days, Frank, not a university. When I went to Freed Hardman College, my parents lived in Mesa, Arizona. I drove 1,545 miles one way to get to college. My dad had one rule for that trip. Wherever you stop, you call me collect. That was the rule. My mother later would inform me that he would pace. He would decide about what time I would stop. And somehow or another, he had a pretty uncanny way of knowing when I would stop. But he would pace up and down until the phone rang. And they said on the other end, I have a collect call from Gary Hampton. Will you take it? And he would always say, yes. And then he would say, where are you? And he especially liked to know when I was safely at Freed Hardman. Now, it needless to say, I didn't go home on the weekends. <laughs> but when I did go home, or when I went back to school, that was always the way that it was. He knew I was safely wherever when he got the phone call. Now listen to this. On the day of Pentecost, when Peter is challenged along with the others, 
Because folks don't understand why they're able to speak in languages they never studied. When they are challenged about that, he says, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And he begins to explain that by the very fact that on this day, they are speaking by the power and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. By that very fact, we can know of a surety, a surety that Jesus is on the throne. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know surely that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. How do you know? Because the Spirit came. That's how we know. Now the last enemy to be defeated, as we've already seen, will be death in the general resurrection. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, the writer makes it plain to us precisely what is being talked about, really, in 1 Corinthians 15, when in verse 14 of Hebrews 2, he begins, Inasmuch then, as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The ultimate defeat of Satan, the ultimate defeat of all enemies will come when all Christians come out of the tomb. On that day, you can be assured that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. And when that assurity comes... Then, point five, he will give the kingdom to the Father. Go back to verse 24, which you may have observed that I skipped over. I did it on purpose because it agrees with verse 28. Listen to what he says. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. At the end of time, the word end here is the word telos. And it describes literally the absolute end of a thing. When the end of time comes, Jesus will deliver the kingdom to the Father. Why? Because all this will be done. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, the apostle Peter says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. What's going to happen? This is done. This is finished. And when it's finished, then Jesus will deliver the kingdom over to the Father. Verse 28 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul finally says, Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. The reassurance of this chapter is without parallel. Christ is the first fruits. All will come forth from the grave in Christ. The order of the resurrection is set forth. Jesus being raised first. Then the dead in Christ. Then those who are alive in Christ. And then the wicked dead will also be raised to go to their punishment. All enemies will be subjected to him. And finally, Jesus will deliver the kingdom to the Father. Now here is what we all need to ask ourselves. Am I continuing to obey God? Remember, those that do not continue will be lost. But here's the good news. God's given us a way to come back even if we stopped. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just. Forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can, we can come back home. What about those who have not yet come home? Well, the beauty of that is that when Peter made his great argument, said, God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ, that some at least, many within the audience, cried out and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter answered so simply and so powerfully, he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that same is available to us tonight. If you want to be a part of the great family of God in the resurrection, come to know Christ tonight as we sing.